Well, welcome to the Striving for Eternity Academy. We are glad to have you with us. This is going to be a little bit of a different class than we usually have. We have been going so far, we've been going through our class of world religions, and we've been doing, uh, a, well, that's been our school, and our class that we're doing is an introduction to the major Western religions. Um, we would have been doing Islam. We are not going to do that tonight because we're going to do questions and answers. We just came back from NorCal Fire, and that is an event we put on, an evangelism outreach and conference that we put together. Had a great time there, but we have a Q&A at the end of those, and sometimes, like this time, we don't get to answering all of the questions. These are the ones that were not answered. So we're going to try to do that here today. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. I will also encourage you, if you regularly watch the Striving for Eternity Academy and you watch live, I encourage you to go to the Striving for Eternity Ministries Facebook page, not the group, but the page, and help us out. You know, we started doing the classes on Catholicism. We started on Judaism and then did the ones on Catholicism. And we had three classes on Catholicism with thousands of comments and hundreds of commenters. And it, we have not been able to keep up with all of the comments. We have tons of Roman Catholics that are engaging on those uh, videos, those classes that we did. Interesting thing, if you read those, you'll see I've been asking the same question over and over. They keep telling me I'm wrong, that I'm attacking the church, I'm so mean, and I keep asking, can you name one thing that I stated that's inaccurate? What did I say that's not true Roman Catholic teaching? I haven't gotten that one thing yet. I'm still waiting. So if you're out there listening, Roman Catholics, if you're going to say I'm wrong, if you're going to say that I'm attacking the church, at least provide the evidence. Here's why I'm also asking you to, for some help here. Next class, we're going to start on Islam. And so I'm sure that's really going to... I mean, I ex didn't expect the, the response we got from Roman Catholicism. I expect a response from Islam. So if you've ever wanted an opportunity to witness to Muslims and put the, tr the classes to work, you know, put it to, to the test, this is going to be the time is now. Uh, will be next class. So that being said, let's get to some of the questions. I put the, I did go through these questions and, and at least categorize them so we could try to get some of them together. Uh, I'm going to start with this one because it goes well with what we just were studying on Catholicism. Uh, so the question was, what is the difference between Christianity and Catholicism? Uh, this was a question actually that I just heard recently. Matt Slick was asked on on his radio program. Oh yeah, I should. Hey, you like the new t-shirt, the new shirt, the new polo that they gave me? Wraith, Wraith, Wrath and Grace dot, uh, clothing is who produces it. I think it's Wrath and Grace dot com. Uh, Johan makes these for us. They're nice. It's a nice polo shirt, embroidered. Does a great job. He makes t-shirts and whatnot. Uh, so encourage you to go out to them. Uh, but uh, Matt Slick was asked this question: What is the difference between? Uh, Christianity and Catholicism as if aren't they the same thing. I dealt with this a little bit in the class that we did and the fact that I, they're not the same. Catholicism doesn't say they're the same. Why? For, you know, much of 2,000 years, Roman Catholicism has been killing Christians. They've been killing people who believe, well, like I believe, most of you believe. And so, they said in the Council of Trent and the Vatican Council that people who believe like you and I, those that believe in the Bible alone, those who believe in justification by faith alone, are anathema, are cursed. Throughout the centuries, they had been killing Christians. So we make this distinction between Roman Catholicism and Christianity, and Christianity didn't start with Protestants in the 1500s. There have always been people who have disagreed with the Roman Catholic Church that the Roman Catholic Church killed off. When they own the empire, when it's the emperor, you get in a situation where those that believe in the Bible alone didn't have much opportunity to publish. Remember, this is before times when publishing was as easy as it is today. Uh, it was a time when it was very costly, 
And so we do have works that some people wrote and they gave their life for that. And so um, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. That, that, that's from the chat room. Okay, someone in the chat room said they, that about Roman Catholics, they believe that we're heretics and that's the point. We, we believe they're not saved by their doctrine and they would, if they're true to their doctrine, would believe that we cannot be in heaven and redeemed by our doctrine. So they would say that we're heretics and you know we'd say the same about them. And you know the difference is, is they want to be able to say, hey, we're Christians just like you. you know, I've noticed the Mormons are doing this, the Jehovah Witnesses are doing this. They want to be Christians just like us, yet their foundation of their religion is to say that we had problems, that we fell away, that we needed to be restored, or that we're in error, and you want to be like us? I mean, if we're in error, why would you want to be like us? Oh, it was T.N. Hills. Okay, T.N. Hills was the one that made that comment. And why do I bring that out? Um, she's been one of the people that have been engaging with the Roman Catholics. Uh, I think she even has some blogs that she has been doing from, based on that. She's been doing some her own study on Roman Catholicism. And, and I think she has, I think I read the last one I read, I think it was part four or five, or six actually. Uh, but she's got several uh, real good, uh, interesting um, uh, articles that she's got on her blog that she's been dealing with. Uh, and so, yeah, if, if, Tn, if you're in the um, if you're in the if you're in the chat, if you could post the link to your uh, blog, and that way I can give people that. So let's move on. Next question was actually for Justin Peters, but I think I can answer this one because we talked about it. The question is, Justin, what do you think of the War Room movie? I know what Justin thinks about it because, well. He wrote an article about it, and you can go to Justin Peters Ministries. I think it's justinpetersministries.com, maybe .org, um, and he has. A, I think it's up there. Is his review of uh, Worm? It's like a 12-page review, but let me give you kind of in short what his view was. Uh, there were some good points. He, he's not really a fan of the Christian genre, Christian movie genre. Uh, you know, and I, I understand a lot of times they're cheesy. Their doctrine's not so good. The the Kendrick brothers were doing really good quality movies theologically, and then uh, this one. You know, the the big issue that, and I agree with with Justin on this one. The the idea of the name it and claim it, the idea that. People can just pray and God's going to give them what they want uh, was throughout this movie, supposedly. I'm going to, for the record, I did not watch the movie, uh, but um, I've read several reviews of people who have. Justin read it, so I'm telling you Justin's opinion. Uh, but it, if this was portrayed as Justin said, I'm totally in agreement with it. Uh, but Justin was saying that the, the kind of name it and claim it type of prayer is, is prominent. He also had a real issue with the... Um, the fact that this guy, who's the main character, who is uh, just not a, a good guy, uh, he's having an affair with, on, with his wife and different things like this, and they refer to him as just being backslidden. The assumption that that like everyone's a believer or that there's you know instead of him coming to repentance, um, so. Those are some of the issues. Justin has more that he mentioned. He had some positive things to say as well, so you can check that out. Oh, we do? Okay. Uh, so, the the website for TN's um, uh, blog is KT Under Grace. KT Under Grace, one word, dot blogspot.com. So, you could check that out. And uh, so... That would be a, a thing that you could do is check out hers. So let's move on to the next question. I want to try to do these kind of rapid fire, get as many questions as we can in the, the hour. Hopefully they will be helpful for you. This is an interesting one. And uh, this one I think was one of the ones that was in the category of, you know, there's not going to be enough time to answer this one in the format that we had. But uh, I'm going to read the question exactly as it is, and then I'm going to give you what I think the person was asking, but what do we what do we do when we are attacked by a Christian quote Christian while sharing? Okay. So 
I think I think what the question being there is you're out on the street sharing the gospel. That's what I assume is the topic, and it, it could be two different things. It could be sharing the gospel. Uh, one person, when I was asking, talking this question over with, thought it could be um, just sharing God's word, and and there is plenty of people who get attacked. Uh, uh, you know, like we do here for sharing the truth of God's word, and so. Um, so with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that it's dealing with the issue of uh, sharing the gospel. And we deal with this a lot. How do you deal with, uh, and the reason this was one of those questions I said that may, they thought were too much answers, is initially interpreted as being, uh, being attacked by other Christians just for sharing your views or your theology. But so when we are out on the street a lot of times, especially if you're down in the south, Everyone professes that they're a Christian, and yet their lifestyle. I, I remember that being down in, at Fall for Greenville, in Greenville, South Carolina, and we had this guy who was getting really, really rude. Um, just really being rude to the, to the preacher who was preaching. And there was some guy in the crowd, two beers in his hand, he was drunk, and he was ready to get into a fist fight with the heckler. And his argument was, well, I'm a Christian. I didn't like what he was saying about that, you know, about my brother up there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking you're not a Christian like he's a Christian. Just saying, you know, <laughs> a little bit of a difference in, in the term Christian. And that's the thing. That we understand that there, there's false converts out there. I actually, uh, I, I think that a lot of times when people throw out the, I'm a Christian, it's, an, it's a logical fallacy. It's an appeal to authority. What they're saying is... Um, they're, 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 they're attacking the Christian preacher really because they don't like what he's saying or they don't like the style in the way he's saying it because he's just standing up and putting it out there. And unfortunately, we're living in a generation where a lot of people, quite frankly, they, they want to try to live a Christian life and live like the world. They don't want to be attacked by the world. And you're seeing this, in a moral collapse within Christianity where they're just you know, giving up on biblical values to accept the world's values just because they want to get along and they don't want to be attacked, they want to be accepted. Christianity will never be accepted by the world. And so that, that's one point. And one of the things though with me with someone like that is my heart breaks. I mean, it's just hard to think, you know, they're going to they're gonna be one of those people that are going to stand before Christ on, on Judgment Day and they're going to go, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these things for you? And he's going to go, I never knew you'd depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My heart breaks for people like that. I don't get prideful and like, oh, yeah, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. So, so what do we do? Here's, the question is, what do we do when we have a person like that? Here's what I do. The way that I like to handle that is I like to ask them a question that goes like this. If I have someone saying that they, they're a Christian, I don't know what they mean by Christian. I'll ask them, how did you become a Christian? I, could, I may ask them what church they go to. I find it, they, you know, a lot of times they'll say they're a Christian, but they don't go to church. They can't find a good church. Uh, they're a Christian, but they can't explain the gospel. Sometimes I'll, I'll ask, the, you know, can you explain the gospel to me? Can you tell me how to become a, a believer? And they'll just say, well, believe on Jesus. And I'll say, what if I'm Jewish and I believe that Jesus is Hitler's God and I want nothing to do with him? Because that's what I grew up believing. And so they really don't know the gospel. But a question I like to ask to really ex show and explain really the issue because a lot of times they go, well, I don't go to church, but I have a relationship with God. I don't need religion. I have a relationship. I, and I, okay, you have a relationship. I ask them how many times uh, on average a month they read the Bible. The overwhelming average is three to four times. They'll tell me, yeah, maybe three or four times a month. And so I say, okay, three or four times a month. I don't ask if they pray because many people seem to pray when they're in trouble. But... But I ask them how many times they read their Bible. And then when they tell me three or four, I say, let me give you a scenario and see how, how good of a relationship you would have. Suppose you got married or when you got married, your spouse, you get back from the honeymoon and your spouse says, hey, that was a great wedding. Love the honeymoon. I'm going to go back to my place. Maybe I'll give you a call three, four times a month and we could chat. What kind of relationship do you have? I didn't even get to the point of asking what kind of relationship you have with one woman. She goes, I'd kill him. <laughs> and, and so I said, so what kind of relationship would you have? She goes, none. He'd be dead. 
And I said, so what kind of relationship do you have with Christ if you're only listening to Him, hearing from Him three or four times a month? And usually they go, ow, right? And like that one woman that wanted to kill her husband was just like, oh, I mean, just deflated. Because it makes the point, if you're going to say you're a Christian and you're going to profess that, but you don't read God's Word, you're not listening to Him. It's a one-way Christianity. You want God to accept you on your terms, and you get to direct to God the, the terms. And uh, so that's not Christianity. All right, next question. Regarding open-air preaching, how should we go about asking slash seeking accountability, support, and oversight? Good question. Um, I think that with that, um, it is a thing where when we look at that, we have to be aware that we do need the accountability. What I suggest doing is let your pastors know, your, your leadership know what you're doing. Um, maybe they'll even come out with you. Uh, we here at the at Striving Fraternity have a friend in the ministry, go, Joe Conkle, and he goes out every week with his pastor to evangelize because he asked him. Now they go out and they take their, uh, he, ha he went out and bought a prayer stand. A prayer stand is, is put together by, from a, a friend of our, the ministry here. Uh, I, I, go tell, uh, I forget, they just look up prayer stand. You'll see it's a, a, a it's basically this, uh, I don't know, I really don't know how to describe it. But it basically has a tel telescoping pole that says prayer up top. So if, I think if you just type prayer stand, you're going to find it. But, but you know, Joe just wanted to go out and hand out gospel tracts and have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and he wanted to be accountable to his church. So what do you do? He asked his pastor. His pastor says, hey, can I come with you? Yeah, okay. So every week they go out and they set up their prayer stand, and they go out there and, and do that. And now that's the kind of accountability we all would like to have, right? <clears throat> but what if your pastor doesn't agree? Now, the question specifically was with open-air preaching, because, well... Yeah, that's the one that gets a lot of grief. You know, even at NorCal Fire this week, the host church, uh, they knew of uh, Dan Bowen, who is the guy that does all the organizing for, for the local organizing. He's with, um, he's with uh, uh, Open Air Campaigners out there in the Bay Area. And uh, you, you can end up looking uh, at someone like him, and, you know, he's just out open air preaching. He's friends with the pastor and, and the pastor's wife on Facebook, and they... They didn't have the best opinion of, you know, of open air preaching because why? They've usually seen bad, you know, examples of it. We all have, and so a lot of people are not thrilled with open air preaching. And they got a chance to see Dan in action and was like, "Wow, that's really cool. Can we come out with you next week?" You know, uh, so the, it's in the chat. I'm being told that in the chat is the website for the prayer stands. It's go for for the no, what is that? It's G O F O R T H A L L dot org. Go for Go for Thrall, I guess. Hmm. But uh, and it's slash prayerstations dot com. Uh, I thought it was sound like, like that. So I'm, uh, but anyway, so what you have with that is I would first suggest you talk to your pastor. Um oh go forth all. Got it. Goforthall.org. There we go. Uh, um, and so, oh, Dorothy's saying that her pastor comes out with her to Texas Tech almost every Wednesday. So, so you see, the, the reality is a lot of pastors, they live in the Christian bubble where everyone they're talking to are Christians. And so what you could do is you could invite your pastor and maybe it gets him to get out and evangelize as well. Uh, sometimes some pastors want to, but they're, you know, they could be embarrassed as well. They, they have just the same nervousness as we all have. Uh, so that'd be the best. But if your pastor and leadership doesn't agree with open air preaching, you're going to have to decide whether you're not going to do it. You can still evangelize, but not do the open air if that's the way you want to do it. If they actually ask you not to do it. Um, now, you know, if they're going to ask you not to open air, the question is going to be, are you giving out gospel tracts with their website name on it? Maybe the thing is say, well, look, I'm going to do this as an individual, not as a member of this church. 
um, because I'm commanded to share the gospel. And so this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> so that's one thing you could do. I, I encourage you to say, you know, bring people with you to say, would you just come and pray while I evangelize? I used to have a person that I said, look, they didn't want to hand out tracts or anything. I said, would you just come out? Do me a favor, just come on out. And what I'd like you to do is just pray. Just hold the video camera. And the, re the only reason we have a video camera, you don't see lots of videos. No, we don't put them up. Uh, the reason we have the video camera really is for our own protection, just in case people say we did something, said something, we have proof. Uh, and this person running the video camera used to get asked all the time, hey, what are you guys doing out here? And they were in gospel conversations over and over and over and, uh, and got used to evangelizing. So it, it's just something to, to think about is just ask someone to come out from your church to, to, to join you, to pray while you're out there, just so you're not alone. But I would go to your church... Um, and so I would, I would end up looking at your church to see what's their position going to be. And if they're against it, what I would say you do is, is work with them. Try to find out why they're against it. Invite your leadership out and see maybe, maybe their impression of open air evangelism just is different than what you're doing. If you're doing it well and they've only seen bad examples, then, you know, you want to do, you want to check that out. All right, next question. I said I'm trying to keep it short. We're, how, how many minutes? 20 minutes into class? So I still have a bunch more questions. We'll try to get through all of them. All right, next question. Top three reasons why Christianity is true and give a little details. All right, why is Christianity true? Three reasons. So, um, reason number one Christianity is true because it comes from God. Now, how do you support that? Well, I would support that this way. Every world religion is going to be bucketed into one of two things. You either have a religion of human effort, Islam, Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Hinduism, Buddhism, every ism you got, every single one of them. Um is going to say that you are saved or right, made right with God through human effort. Christianity is the only one that says it's by divine effort, by what God did. How do we know it's true? Because God did the work, not man. Man-made religions put man as the one that does the work. God created religions, God does the work. So, since Christianity is the only one in the category of God doing the work, that's how I would say it's true. It's true because it comes from God. Now you say, well, wait a minute. How does that prove it's true? Because God cannot lie. Therefore, if God says this is true and He cannot lie, that makes it true. And now some people are saying, wait a minute, Andrew. How do you know God cannot lie? Because He said so. See, so you have circular logic. You're saying, God, we, we can trust the Bible because God doesn't lie, but you only know that God doesn't lie because of the Bible. Well, yes, the Bible is the most authoritative source for that. The other source for that is, well, the fact that we get a knowledge of good coming from the nature of God. God cannot do evil, and therefore, God can't lie. We, don't, we, we need the Bible to be an authoritative source, <clears throat> and it is an authoritative source because it comes from God. Uh, so that was, what, two reasons. Uh, three, third reason, <clears throat> well, I guess technically, uh, you know, yeah, technically three reasons. But uh, another reason I would give would be, um, you know, Christianity is the only religion that, well, let me split this in two. Christianity is the only religion that offers true hope for eternal life. But that's tied to the reason I was going to say is that in Christianity is the only religion that where you have both grace or sorry, uh, justice and mercy married together. Okay? The reality is is that when you look at even Islam where Muhammad would say that Allah is Allah most merciful. Okay? Most merciful but not just. You see, because in Islam you have Allah letting criminals go because He's showing mercy. That's not justice. In every religion where you have 
God letting criminals go based on other good works that they do, he's not just. I mean, would you consider a judge just if he raped and murdered somebody? And he says, but your honor, I never stole from anybody. Oh, well, you know what? I'm going to show you mercy. You did good in this area. I'm going to let you go. No, he wouldn't be just at all because he's not on trial for stealing. He's on trial for rape and murder, right? You and I are on trial. Every human being are on trial for the sins we commit against the infinitely holy God. That's the reality. We can't say, look, I, wa I walked this old lady across the street. That's nice. That's not what you're being sentenced for. Okay? In Christianity, <clears throat> you have justice and mercy married together. God did punish every sin or will. Every sin will suffer the consequence of punishment. But God, in His mercy, took that upon Himself, but the punishment is still meted out. He just took it upon Himself. And so He did punish, and He did show mercy, and only within Christianity do you see those two married up. Next question. <sighs> All right. I know, I'm trying to get through them quick. We, we still have, what, like uh, six, like almost a dozen questions left. So I'm going to try to get these through these in an hour. Um, regarding, uh, regard, regarding a truth claim, how would you answer a person who claims that the Bible has too many errors to be true? And I'm going to tie this actually with the next question. What the next question was, how can one succinctly express to an honest inquirer the reliability and veracity of the Bible? So I'm going to take these two together. This is dealing with a topic known as uh, textual criticism. All right. How do we know that the Bible is reliable? And the argument usually goes like this, that we have copies of copies of copies, and those copies were changed, and therefore we can't really know what the original Bible said because of all these copies that were copying that was done. So because you have some things worded in some manuscripts one way, it was changed in a different way. There's, that's called a variance when any time you have that. Therefore, the argument states <clears throat> that we can't know what the Bible said. Okay, and because of the fact that, that we have these variances. Now let's deal a couple things with these variances real quick. Um, when we talk about variances, you'll hear those liberals argue that there's 400, over 400,000 variances in the Bible. The strange thing, or, or sorry, in the New Testament, the strange thing about that is that there's more than, there, there's, there's like only 100,000 letters in, in the New Testament. So basically, you have four times as many variances than letters, right? Or, or words and things. So when you look at this, it's like, clearly, when you look at that, how do you have that more variance, four times more variances than you do the, the words or letters and things like that? Well, it's because they count it. Like if I misspell one word, you know, I spell the word uh, cat, and one time I spell it C. O T, and one time I spill it C U T, and so one time it says cot, and one time it says cut, but the word should have been cat. They count that as three variances. I would say it's one variance. Why? Because it's one word. I mean, you had it changed differently. Which one's the right one? Well, okay, let's deal with that later, but it's only one. So, right from there, you know they're exaggerating the numbers. Because you can't have four times the variance than, than the, the words, you know? So, once you do that and you scale that back, you find out that it's really not that much. Now, how do we know it's reliable? First off, the Bible was not created the way they keep arguing that it was a telephone game. One person tells another person, tells another person, tells another. In other words, I wrote a copy and gave it to one person. That person made a copy. That next person made a copy and so on and so on. It's not how it worked. <clears throat> it would have worked that I would have made 10 copies, given it to 10 people, a copy to each, and they made 10 copies, and they gave it to, and they made 10 copies. 
The idea there being different is when you have one person spell cat as cut, you end up in a situation where now the people are, you're, okay, this one guy over here said cut. All these other people, 90% of the people are saying cat. Who do you think is wrong? When you can see these families of manuscripts and you see that everyone in this area, so, you know, everyone in, you know, Ohio got cat or cut and everyone in, in, in New York and Virginia and New Jersey and California all say cat. You're going to say someone in Ohio misspelled it. That's how you would do it. And so then what you end up doing is you look and you go, okay, let's take a look at there and see what happened. There. So you can get back to the original when you realize that some of these manuscript variances are all in a specific geographical area. So you see that oh, it's all those copying that was done there. But all these other areas, because remember, these copies were going all around the world and being made all over the place. So when you see all these other uh, geographic areas, having it done one way and one in one area, you can probably say this, chances are this one's not the right one. So what can you do? You can get back to the word, original word, cat. Okay? Sometimes it's just a misspelling. You know, instead of, you know, you know, cat, they, they put CTA. You know, uh, they were dyslexic. Or, you know, they, they, you know, the context. You know, um, my mom bought me a cut today. A what? You know? Now, it could be cot or it could be cat. But the idea being is one of them, you know, and I, and I took, you know, I took my cut uh, and played with its fur. Well, okay, now it's not a cot, it's a cat, right? You, you can figure out the misspelling. Uh, what, oh, yeah, like autocorrect on my phone, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes autocorrect does its own little variances. <laughs> so what, <laughs> what you have, though, is, is uh, you, you end up realizing that we can get back to the original. In fact, the fact that we have 70,000 manuscripts, we have so many manuscripts in the New Testament that we can then figure out and get back to some of the original by looking at all the other manuscripts. We can figure out where the changes occurred. And this is one of the things, first off, to the reliability. Let me answer this one. Can we succinctly give the reliability? It's simply this. The fact that we have so many copies so many manuscripts, what that allows us is to know where the variances occurred. And because we know where those variances occurred, because of that, that's how we know that not a single doctrine is affected. It's little things like, you know, the fact that some manuscripts say that Jesus was a carpenter, others say he was the son of a carpenter. But there's no doctrine based on that. And so does, does it matter? Can we get back to the original? That, that, that one there is one. We can't get back to the original. Was Jesus a carpenter? We all think so. It would make sense because that's the culture that he would do what, you know, his father did. So if his father was, a, you know, uh, you know, his father was a carpenter, Jesus was probably a carpenter. Fair assumption. So, but, but, so what if you, do we really need to know? Well, we can't, we, in some of those texts, we can't get back to the original to say, based on the, on the, the way that that happened, the, that variance, we can't get back to the original. So, and here becomes the question, does it affect the meaning? So one is, can you get back to the original? Two, can you, does it affect the meaning? And so there are some things that affect the meaning. Him being a carpenter versus the son of a carpenter. It affects the meaning. However, the question that has to be asked is, does it affect any doctrine and the, any teaching of the church? And the answer is no. Okay, <clears throat> so does the Bible have errors? The Bible has copyist changes, times where people would write in the margin some notes and then that worked its way into the text. Um, we have a passage of the Bible uh, where Jesus is, works with the... Uh, the adulterous woman is brought to him. That's probably not in the original manuscripts. Why do we think that? Because we have some manuscripts, you know, it's like in different places. That, that accounting is in different chapters. Well, they didn't have chapters back then, but it's worked its way in different areas of the text. So, you know, is it here? Is it there? You know, we're not really not sure. 
uh, many people think uh, that much of the end of uh, Mark 16 was probably not in the original. Does that affect anything? Well, only if you're a snake handler. You know, uh, the, the, the only thing that that really affects is everything we see in, in uh, Mark is, you know, Mark 16 at the end there. We see other, we have other passages that talk about that. Uh, we see G, uh, Paul get, being bitten by a snake and not dying. But we don't know that Jesus actually said that this would happen. Drinking poison, that, okay, so we don't know anything about that. You know, we, there's no accounting of that. Uh, so that, um, you know, that's how I would answer that, right? We, because we have so many manuscripts, we actually have a better argument. Uh, we don't question Julius Caesar, that he was Caesar, that he died, and yet we have more, we have more evidence for the New Testament than we do Julius Caesar. So the, the, I think, the, the, you know, we have like, the, I think the Iliad is the second closest to the Bible in the number of manuscripts. So we have like 70,000 manuscripts in the New Testament, and we have like, I think they, they have now up to almost 600 of the Iliad. The other thing you want to note with that is how close to the original writing. I think with the Iliad, it's like 1,500 years from the, the, the oldest manuscript we have to the original writing. We're in the Bible we have within 30 years. You know, an area that, that many scholars are going to look for manuscripts are in mummies' tombs in Egypt. Because in Egypt, the, bio, the New Testament was being copied. And the interesting thing is, this is copies that would have been thrown away. And so, uh, the other thing they look for is places where they'd whitewash uh, the, the paper because paper was really expensive, they'd whitewash it and write other things over it, and people find that there's scripture that was whitewashed. The reason that becomes important is this was stuff that was it's typically older, especially in mummies' tombs, where we have things that are within 30 years of its writing, and this is things that people are throwing away. Okay, So, the importance of that becomes, if you're trying to manufacture, as the argument goes, that, there, that people manufactured the, that Jesus was God in the Gospels, and they got rid of the older copies and kept newer copies, then go to places where people threw out old copies, like mummies' tombs, like whitewashing paper, and see what those older ones said. Because those were the ones that people weren't trying to keep around. And you know what we find? <gasps> they match. It wasn't edited. That's where like the Dead Sea Scrolls was so such a great find because the Dead Sea Scrolls actually dated a thousand years prior to the oldest copy of the Bible that we had. And the reason that becomes so important is because, you know, people were arguing like, oh well Daniel must have been written after the Romans because he was he was so detailed in the prophecies. And so they say he couldn't have done this unless it was afterwards. And oops, you find something that's dated a thousand years earlier and you find out that yeah. It was before the Romans because they have it. You know, Isaiah was the argument with Isaiah and all his, his prophecies of Christ that they said there were three Isaiahs and one was uh, one was written to be, um, you know, during Isaiah's real time, and then the two other Isaiahs wrote after the history occurred. But now you find a copy of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is identically matching with the one that we have a thousand years later. No changes. So that's what you end up with. All right, next question. Well, this one's really not a question. Uh, presuppositional apologetics versus evidential apologetics. That's all it says. I guess we could say, go. Uh, I think the reason this question was asked was because Jim Wallace is an evidential apologist, uh, and I would be a presuppositional apologist, so it was like, okay, what, give us the differences. I think that's what's in the question. So let me give you the differences. Uh, and there's a third, which is classical. Uh, Evidential apologetics would argue from the evidence to God. So you'd hear some evidential apologetics say, we don't need the Bible to, to prove God exists, uh, to prove the things of God. And so what they'll do is put, kind of put the Bible on the shelf and argue from nature. Okay, Does nature point to God? Absolutely, He created it. Okay, Is it the best way to argue with, with an unbeliever? Depends on the unbeliever, you know. Uh, are people do people get saved by evidence? 
well, actually, no, they get saved by God regenerating them, right? But, but the evidence is something that God uses to draw them to repentance. So evidence isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm a presuppositionalist, which means I don't throw out the Bible. I start from the Bible and argue from the Bible to God, okay? And so I would end up arguing for, uh, for two presuppositions. There is a God and He has spoken. I don't attempt to try to prove those. Those are just axioms. They're facts. They are. And I don't need any more than that. And so a classical apologist would be a combination. I mean, they, they don't throw out the Bible, and they're not opposed to using evidence. So they'll use the evidence to, to bring people to a knowledge of God. Uh, I don't think evidence is a bad thing. I'm saying that as a presuppositionist. I understand there's some who have made it a strong, hard line thing that it, you, either have, you either have presuppositionalism or evidentialism you know, and, and evidentialism is bad. You can't use any evidence. You know, I knew one friend that you say evidence is a sin. It's not a sin. God told us to come and reason together. God gives us evidences. You know, He tells us, look at look at creation, look at the stars. Uh, he, you know, Jesus when He walked the earth to show that He was God, He said, "Look at the works that I do. They witness or testify of Me." What was he doing? Look at the evidence. That tells you who I am. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with evidence. Uh, so those would be those, the differences there. Uh, this question is, what is your motivation other than the fact that Jesus commands it? The problem is I don't know what it is. I'm going to assume evangelism. Then this question may be a little bit snarky because it says, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. But it says, do you think it's important that you have fresh breath? as to not offend people when you share the gospel with. With what? With who? I don't know. You didn't finish the sentence. Um, but let me ask, answer it. Yeah, the motivation is Christ commanded us to go out, and I love Christ, and I want to do what Christ commands. I also have a care for the people. The people that I'm witnessing to, are they die without Christ to spend eternity in a lake of fire. I'm concerned about that. And that concern is going to make me respond differently. If I'm going out there just because God commands me to go, I can go out there pridefully and feel justified in my pride because I obeyed God and I told that sinner where he's going to go. But if I have a compassion for them and, I, and I'm, I'm concerned and I have pity for the fact that they're going to spend eternity in a lake of fire, I'm going to respond much differently with them. Now, I'm going to be very soft-spoken with them and pleading with them because I, I want them to understand the gospel. Very different approach that you're going to have. All right? So, that's that one. Oh, the fresh breath. Thank you. Fresh breath. Uh, yeah, why wouldn't you want to have a fresh breath? I mean, I, I always carry Tic Tacs with me. And the reason I do is when I have conversations, I just pop a Tic Tac in because, yeah, I drink coffee and coffee gives you bad breath and... You know, so I should really just stop drinking coffee. But you, you, we should do everything. Not just bad breath, but everything that we can do that, to remove any offense that anyone has. We should do it. So don't act like a jerk, because that would be an offense. You know, um, you know that's, that becomes the thing. So let's go on to the next question. Oh, actually, uh, so I kind of answered this one already. I should have grouped it with the other. Why do professing Christians believe that they embarrass Jesus Christ. It's sort of the, the thing. And um, why do professing believers, I think this is really, why do professing believers think that like open-air preachers or, or, or Christians that are living out their faith are embarrassing Christ, I think is how I'd word it um, or, or answer it. Why do professing Christians believe that they embarrass Christ? Maybe it could also be, I guess the question could also be um, that they they think that, you know, a, a, a professing believer is uh, embarrassed by Christianity. And that would, if that's the wording of the question, then it's because people are too focused on the, on the world. Um, you know, they're, 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 th they're using the world as their standard and not the Bible. And so by the world system, God's always going to be out of touch because the world is against God. Okay? So... Uh, that's always going to be the case. 
So you never count on the world to define what embarrassment is. Um, why are professing believers, I think, embarrassed when they see open-air preachers preaching or have Christians out there living the Christian life? Because it exposes that they're not Christian. That's why. All right? Uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. We have uh, got about six more to go, about 15 minutes, and these are the more difficult ones to answer in short time. So, any suggestions on how to encourage my wife to bear fruit slash or grow spiritually? I've asked her to join small group and do family devotion. This is a good question. And it's a hard question. This is one that couldn't be answered in a short period of time. But you cannot change your spouse, period. You can't make someone spiritually grow. Your spouse, your children. I would love to have been able to force my children to grow spiritually mature when they were younger. It would have made things easy, right? That's not the way it works. So we, we have to be aware of that. So you can't force them, first off. You have to know that. But, you know, you, the phrase, you can't lead a horse to water. But you can give them some salt and make them thirsty. And that's what you do. Just have the devotions anyway. Um, you know, I knew someone that their, their child didn't like doing de family devotions. Okay. Make them sit in their room with no toys, or, you know, during family devotions, you're missing out on something. You know, make family devotions a fun time and so that they feel they're missing out on something. Uh, but don't make it a lecture. Don't make it somewhere no one wants to be part of it. You know, if your wife doesn't want to be part of your, or your spouse doesn't want to be part of family devotions, find out why. Now, if it's a wife to a husband, well, that's kind of harder because the husband should be leading it. And if he doesn't want to be part of it, that becomes harder um, because, you know, there's some issues there, but the thing though is, is you want to be careful to um, to make sure that when you're doing it, you're uh, making your you know making an appeal by finding out why don't they want to go to small group? Why don't they? You may think that they're not growing spiritually, but maybe they are just at a different rate than you or what you expect from them. Maybe the problem is your expectations. I'm just saying. So be, you know, make sure you know, I mean, are they having their own devotions? Maybe they're uncomfortable in group settings, in small groups even, and they don't like it. It could be different reasons, um, you know. So, uh, next question. Share some best ways to train up a child on the, uh, on the way of the Lord Balance between exhorting my authority and the child's temperance. This is sort of similar with what I was saying. That's why I grouped these two together. Uh, and this is hard. You want to shepherd their heart. Um, you, you, want to, you want to break their will. I mean, they have a sinful will, a selfish will. And that needs to be broken. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are... Um, that we're doing uh, what God calls us to do as parents, not overbearing and lording over the children, but, uh, but, but having some balance there. Uh, just keep in mind that we're sinners. Your children are sinners. Don't expect perfection from them if you're not perfect. Okay? Uh, and, and so pick your battles. Um, that's, it's a tough one. I would recommend David Tripp's Shepherding a Child's Heart. Uh, as a good book to get for that. All right, this question was uh, for Justin Peters, but I guess I'm going to try to answer it for myself. Uh, do you think that all those who are under the umbrella of Pentecostalism are not regenerate? How do you draw the line, uh, the line with regards to salvation? I think the issue there is, you know, there's a difference between wacky, charismatic. And charismatic, okay? Um, I have a lot of good friends. Dan, who is uh, who helps us in NorCal Fire, Dan Bowen, he b does not believe that the gifts ceased. Now, he doesn't speak in tongues or any of that stuff, but he doesn't say that he thinks they stopped because he doesn't see it in, in the text of Scripture. That he sees a, a good argument for it. I disagree with him, but that's okay. The point, though, being is... Um, 
you have a difference between someone that can believe that these gifts still exist today, but is not being over con or controlled or overwritten by, uh, by emotionalism. And that's really the issue. When you see the wacky side, you'll see that they're all based on emotions, and emotions what drives them. Emotions is what uh, def you know they use to uh, to define their uh, their thinking. So I just dropped the card. Hold on, I'm off camera. Sorry, I dropped the card. We got three more questions. Let's see if we can get to these in the next ten minutes. How would you address family and friends in a former church about Charis charismaticism. They're deeply held to these teachings and ignore those in the warning of danger. So again, I, I kept these two together. They're kind of similar. Um, the issue here is, we, so you think they're in danger. Maybe they're in a church that is the over-emotional time a kind. And so because of that, you see a danger there and you, you want to spare them. Well, again, it's not your spiritual walk. It's theirs. If they're believers, if they're regenerate, I trust that the Holy Spirit is going to work on them. Maybe they never come out of it. Maybe God never wanted to put it on their heart to come out of it. You, you, you lovingly share with them what you believe. Now keep in mind though, much of the charismatic, especially the wacky kind, is based on emotionalism. And emotionalism makes it harder to argue with because people don't use reasoning, they use their emotions. And so it's harder, you're coming to them with, hey, look, this is what the scripture says, but they're ignoring it because of their experience. And that's often what I find, is people will, will reject what the scripture says because of their experience. And I have to tell them, look, your experience doesn't matter. What matters is the truth. That's what matters. And so some people like it and some people don't. All right, next question, why some people are chosen and some are not? And so this is the issue of Calvinism or Arminianism. We have a lot of different uh, issue, uh, class, we have, I think, three classes on this subject. We have uh, several papers on this subject. I have a paper on Romans 9 and 10. What you see there is, I think that, and I'm going to give this short answer, uh, I think that God chooses who He wants to choose, and yet that choosing is not apart from our will. Okay, I believe that God works through us so that the choices that we make to choose Him are exactly as He intended, so He gets all the credit and we get none. And so God chooses in how, whatever means He understands, and we don't, we don't know. And so the best I could say is Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord, but that which He has made clear to you has been commanded to you to teach to, to obey and teach to your children. That's a paraphrase, by the way. I didn't get it exact. Last question. And it was to Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters, you mentioned promises made to national Israel. Is God still covenanting with nation Israel, or is the church true or spiritual Israel? Um, I'll answer that on his behalf from my perspective. Again, we have, I think, three classes that we did in our systematic theology. Uh, I think they're around like 58, 59, 60, 61, somewhere around there, we, on dispensationalism. We have two Google Hangouts on discussing with, uh, on our YouTube page on covenant theology versus dispensational theology and new covenant theology versus a versus dispensational theology. Uh, and, and really, that's what's at the heart of this question. Okay, the heart of dispensationalism and covenant theology is what place does Israel and the church have? Okay, is the church a replacement of Israel? Is Israel the church and the church Israel? Or are they two separate distinct things? And I would say they're two separate distinct things. Are there illustrations that are used for both that are similar? Yes. Does it mean they're the same thing? No. Okay, you can use an illustration of marriage to be for the nation of Israel and for the church, and there's still two separate bodies. Uh, there is, I believe, a distinction between Israel and a church. And so, for that reason, I would say that, there are, that God is still having a covenant with Israel, though right now they are in a state of disobedience for a very long time as a punishment. No different than they were in seven, the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And a day is coming where they will recognize Christ as Messiah, and He will work with them again. So that is 
my position. And we actually got through all those questions. That was a lot of questions that we got through. I'm glad that we were able to do it. <clears throat> and uh, I, I hope maybe that answers some questions that some of you others had. Uh, every once in a while we try to do this, uh, answer questions. Now next class we're going to get into, um, we will get back into uh, the world religion study. We will deal with Islam. And so that will be the lesson that we will have. Um, <clears throat> and we will have a, well let's see, what other announcements do we have? Well, you can buy my book. It's out of print. But we're getting it back in print. <laughs> what do they believe? You can also check out the new website, whatdotheybelieve.com. Whatdotheybelieve.com is a new website about the book. <clears throat> the first printing totally sold out of the book. I was blown away by that and went so quick. I mean, we, we bought enough books, I thought we'd have a two-year inventory. And we are out of books in like four to five months, less than five months, we're completely out. And so we are going to another printing. It's gonna be a larger inventory that we're getting now. Um, and so we're excited about that. Uh, and yeah, we did make some subtle changes to the book as well. Uh, in case you wanna get multiple vo volumes, you can get this first printing and the second printing. You could have two. Um, and so, uh, so, but uh, that, that really, I'm very humbled that the, that book has been doing so well, dealing with the, uh, systematic theology of the major Western religions. Uh, really humbled by that. Really glad to see that so many people are being blessed by that book. I encourage you to get it. Um, and so it's also available on Amazon. So we like to put a person to encourage. We always want to encourage you to encourage others. And the reason we do that is because, quite frankly, we, most of the time we only say encouraging things about people after they're dead. And we all need to hear an encouraging word. And we have a sister who, well, she's going through a rough, a painful time, shall we say, with great joy afterwards. And that's our sister, An Amber uh, Hohmeyer. Amber just gave birth. That was the painful part. <laughs> and with great joy, uh, this is her first child. And so she's going to go into those sleepless nights. If you've ever had a child and you know what that's like. Uh, Amber has been helping us here at the ministry. I'm working on a new book called uh, Jesus Christ Claims the Deity. I've preached like 25, 26 sermons on that, and she's been helping to transcribe that. Uh, we're soon going to have some other people that are going to be coming along and helping with that as well. And so uh, we're really thankful for her. And we ask this, that you'd encourage her this week, because she's congratulated her on her the, the birth of her child. But, I, I, but don't just stop there. Encourage her, because over the next couple of weeks, she's going to be exhausted. Why? Because she's not sleeping. She'll need the encouragement. So try to encourage her this, this week if you can, uh, and that'd be really good. And until next time, remember to strive to make today an eternal day for the glory of God.